Thanks for downloading Grilled. Please take a minute to rate us or follow us so more people can find us and listen to the ramblings of some of the best chefs in the UK. I'm Cara, editor of the Staff Canteen, and in this episode I caught up with Lee Westcott at Penson's Restaurant. He took some time out of service at his lunch event with Tom Brown to talk to me about how it felt to finally get a Michelin star after missing out when he was at Typing Room. Uh, Lee was at t- Typing Room for four years before he sadly closed the doors, but Penson's has hit the ground running since opening in 2019. Previously, Lee has worked with top chefs, including Jason Atherton and Tom Akins, and he shares what he took from both of them in this podcast. We discussed his first experience of shooting a deer and how he couldn't bring himself to eat it. It hasn't put him off meat, but he's not in a rush to do it again. And I also tried my best to find out what the weirdest DM he has ever had was. He's a hard nut to crack. Okay, so to start with, we're in Penson's now, and you've just got a Michelin star. So let's start with that. Congratulations. Thank and you. how did that feel to finally get your hands on the Michelin star? To finally get my hands on one. Uh, yeah, it was nice. It was quite uh, unexpected, if I'm honest. Yeah. It was only eight months, so I wasn't, I wasn't obviously, well, I wasn't positive of getting one, you know, in any form, but eight, eight months, I didn't think we were going to get it that quick. Yeah. And we, and we did. So it was a nice, pleasant surprise, but yeah, it was a bit of a surreal feeling, I guess, because... Yeah. It's my first star. Has it sunk in now you've put like the plaque on the wall? Yeah, that's when it did sink in. Yeah. Not, not really when I went on stage or anything. And got and was awarded it at the ceremony. It was more <laughs> when you put the plaque on the wall. Yeah. Because then yeah, it's just a bit of a roller coaster of emotions when you get it and it's like a really lovely thing. And then when you get back to work and you just got, you know, crack on again. You, you kind of, you not forget about it, but you just get back to the grind of it. And then when that plaque comes, it's like, actually, yeah, we've just got a star. Yeah. And I've got to ask, because of Typing Room, your name was in the Michelin categories for everyone yeah. thought you were going to get a star at Typing Room. Yeah. You didn't get a star at Typing Room. You've got a star here. Was it a bit of a bittersweet moment for you? Because obviously there's the terror in type, where Typing Room used to be. They yeah. got a star this year as well. No, it wasn't. It, was, it wasn't bittersweet. It was, it was kind of bittersweet, but honestly, they, those guys totally deserve it. I got, you know, yeah. totally. And uh, yeah, it was weird. I didn't get it there. I, I don't know why. Maybe I really piss Michelin off in some way I don't know why or how um, but we've got it we've got it you know now and it's lovely to be recognised at least do you think it's easier to get a star outside of London oh I don't know how many people have asked me that question now outside of London um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say so I, I, I don't know I don't know what their criteria are or how they work really but I, all I know is we worked our we worked our arse off and, and it's just I think we, I think we deserve to get the star, um, and whether it's outside of London or not, I don't know because of that. I have no idea. Have you massively changed what you do to what you were doing no. at Typing Room? No, no. There's like there's some classics that I've kept on. I say classics, like some signatures that, you know, I, I, I have truly opened up with my mindset of I wasn't going to do anything I've done before, and then I did my first menu and I was like, actually, some of the stuff like I have friends and family come and eat. You do friends and family, and they came and they said, but where's this gone? Where's this gone? Like, put that back on. That one, that was banging. And I was like, oh, I took it off because I wanted to like sort of re, not reinvent myself, but like, what I realised, have a few st- good, solid staples, and change the rest. And then yeah, so we got. So no, I haven't changed that much from what we did at Typing Room, but yeah. Yeah. Just location. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe is it? I don't know. <laughs> So on that, obviously Penson is, is beautiful. Um, what made you want to be a part of this? It was, like, a bit, what, it's, what was it it's the building. Yeah. The building and the partnership. Um, the building, which is for me, I love like this the old natural wood. The, you know the beams and the high the high ceilings and the natural brickwork. It's like what I like in my my personal spaces, my flats. Yeah. And, and stuff like that where I live. Um, so it's just, I mean, it's a pleasure to have. An input from the start, a huge input from the start. So, yeah, it's just, and it's a project from the start. Yeah. So it's nice to be part of something like you can build upon. Yeah. And that was that was the draw really. And then obviously the estate. So it's, like it's 1,200 acres. That's 1,200. That's 1,200 football pitches. It's that's massive. That's big. <laughs> yeah. Like we've got like things growing out of our ears that we can't even keep up to date with. So like. Are you an avid forager now? Yeah, but do you know what? We've got. Luckily, we've got two gardeners and. We, we've been solidly working the kitchen our, our ass off and 
the gardeners have been fantastic and going out for us and foraging a lot. But we yeah, we do. Just now it's winter, there's not too much to forage. Yeah. But yeah, in the summer we're out as much as we can to get a bit of sunshine. Yeah. <laughs> get out of the kitchen, yeah. <laughs> um, and so what was that that journey like getting to this point here? Because obviously was it a, was it quite hard to close type of move, walk away from that? Well emotionally. Then, yeah, like was it quite yeah, tough? Yeah, no, it was very tough because um, I felt like I took the type of room as far as I could take it. It was four years. Yeah. Um, you know, I just thought, and that area, Pleasant Green, is, is a tough area. Yeah. And it, we, were, we were starting to struggle slightly um, in terms of numbers and stuff. Uh, and I just thought, you know what, four years, I think it's time to have a change. I wasn't planning moving out of London. And then this came about, and I thought, well, I've been in London for 12 years. Why not just try something different? Yeah. So it's, then that comes to a natural close then and it was tough moving out of London I was like it's, but not, it's my home it's, you know it still is my home yeah. and such how quick was it leaving time rooms coming to here was that, that well I planned to take a year off yeah and then I took this job within about four weeks oh really I started, so I started within about two months after so you weren't really in any kind yeah, of it wasn't, weird limbo it genu- you really genuinely sure. wasn't yeah. planned it was something that just sort of um, you know it wasn't I didn't leave time room for this it just happened naturally yeah and then I just came here Terrified. <laughs> still terrified. <laughs> nah, not terrified. <laughs> and still, you're still so early in. But like, are you? What are you finding with this? Like, are you enjoying it? Is it because it is completely different to it where is, you it's were a different, and lifestyle? It's a different pace of life. Lifestyles. I try to go to London as much as I can because yeah. it's nice to be around. Well, my friends, family, and whatnot, and chefs. A lot of chefs that I know and are all there. So it's nice. And restaurants. It's nice to go back and see them and mingle with them but yeah pace of life has changed you know I drive you know I've sort of replaced the central line for tractors <laughs> right pain in the ass. very narrow roads yeah windy <laughs> narrow roads if, if it's wet you're definitely gonna be late for work because people just slow down so bad <laughs> um, yeah it's, it, it's, a, it's been a huge adjustment and you, you've got to adjust quick as well but I've done it before I've moved you know I've moved to other countries and stuff like that. I've, I'm kind of used to it. Yeah. And it's not that big of a shock. So for people who haven't been to Pensilis, what? how would you describe it? What is it What is it like? Well, it's like farm to table kind of ethos. Um, not ju- Yeah, so it's, you know, it's in the middle of nowhere. You've got to make the effort to come here, but I think once you're here, it's a very comforting setting. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. About is it tough having a destination restaurant? Is it? Yeah. Was that a worry? Well, actually, it was was my biggest worry. So me and my, you know, my business partner Peter, she, she said, she guarantee me that this should food fill this restaurant, and that was my one thing. I said, look, I don't think even, you know, you, if you you can use my name as much as you want, I don't think it will fill this restaurant, and it has. Yeah. Not my name, but we we're busy. We have, we have together filled this restaurant. Like we are. I think the stars helped as well, um, but we are like, pretty much nearly fully booked lunch and dinners, which is fantastic. Yeah. And we are a drive away, you know, for people local, for them saying something's close to them is like an hour's drive, so they're happy to drive an hour. I yeah. mean, in London, you'd be like, an hour? I'm not going there. <laughs> it takes an hour to get anywhere in London, what are you want? Yeah, you say that. I've seen, I've seen my brain's warped now, I ain't been there for ages. <laughs> it takes an hour to get five miles in London. <laughs> yeah, that's true. True. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very true, actually. So that must be a relief then. That the the main thing that you wanted was obviously anyone would want is a full restaurant. And yeah, but that, that wasn't the case when we thought like it was. There were some scary services yeah. times when we thought, wow, we're not going to film this place. And to be fair, we got busy because the locals. I guess, I guess whenever, whenever you open a restaurant, you've got to worry about the locals, the, the area that you're in, the neighbourhood. People are a bit sceptical about us at first. Did we know what we were about? Thought, probably thought we were going to be a bit snobby, a bit of a fine dining snobby restaurant, but it's not that at all. It's, yeah. it's fine dining, but it's, it's totally a relaxed service. Yeah. You know, and it's not snobby, and most of our guests at lunchtime time are repeat customers that live around here. Okay. So we've won the we've won the, we've won the area over really, yeah. which is nice. And yeah, I think that's just what you got to concentrate on. Yeah. And we did, and luckily that worked out for us. And embrace the good like, it's the tasting menu. Tasting menu um, in the evenings, yeah. as well as an a la carte. Okay. And then Friday, Saturday nights, we just do a tasting menu. And okay. we also do a little lunch menu, which is the cheaper, cheaper dishes. Um, 
just so you can come in and have like you know free courses for like, I think forty pounds. So something for everybody then. Yeah, and then what's interesting is on the weekends we get people that travel in from London or travel in from Bristol or Birmingham, and it's a bit of a sort of younger crowd um, in the weekends. Mm-hmm. So it's quite nice each day have a different different vibe. Yeah. Different playlist. And on tasting menus, then, so Sat recently, uh, Sat Baines recently said that they're not dead. Yeah, I, I, the way I look at tasting menus, you should highlight your best dishes, your strongest, um, sort of the strongest experience that you can give them of your food. Yeah. So I have a lot of my staples on there because I think they're my strongest, my sort of signatures that I've done for a while. Because, but then it's a tough one because then you've got to change it for the regulars that come again and again. They want they want a different taste menu, yeah. different dishes. So. We try to change it often, but not too often. Yeah. If you know what I mean. But there's a, there's a real skill to it, though, right? It's not you can't just put anything. No, you've got to take a lot. You yeah. got to put a lot of thought into it. Like the dish has got to flow. You have got the right balance of textures and flavors. You can't. You should. I don't think you should repeat any ingredient one uh, twice. Right. Okay. So that's a big thing for me. And then, yeah, it's it's not an easy thing to do. You can't just say, all right, put that 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 that. Yeah. You've got to taste it, and then you've got to do a wine pairing. And it's also got to work, like logistically in the kitchen. Yeah, so there's a lot goes into yeah, it. Yeah, you can't just say, oh, you yeah, do that. That's, but then you'd be like, hang about, this takes 10 minutes to plate, chef. I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, just get on with it, mate. No, I mean, you can't. You just got to, like, yeah. work for everybody. Are you personally, do, if you, when you're going out to eat, do you like a tasting menu or not? That's an interesting question. I do because I'm quite lazy and I don't want to pick what I eat. I like someone to take care of me. Yeah. Um, but I, get, I know people, I know chefs that come to eat here and they just want, they just want to eat, eat some food and go. But not, it's not for everyone who tastes me, but it is for me. I, I like to let someone else do, make my decisions for me. Yeah. No, I'm I just, if I'm off, I'm off. I'm chilling. <laughs> just feed me. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing nothing. <laughs> I don't make any decisions. <laughs> um, on dishes. So when I spoke to you four years ago, your favourite dish in the type group, or one that I'd been on from the beginning, do you know what, they, do you know what it was? No, you tell me. Um, I've probably got the menu now. Yeast of cauliflower. God, yeah, I'm glad that one's gone. <laughs> so that was the one you said to me. That was a ball lake. <laughs> My chefs hated me for that dish. <laughs> Genuinely. I mean, we had a lot of chefs come through typing them, and every single person hated it. No, they loved the dish, but they hated it when, it was on their sec- when they were on that section, because it was a lot of work. Okay, so that's not come with it you. Let me just clarify, it's a nice dish, they loved it. <laughs> <laughs> for anyone listening, they really enjoyed it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was just a ball lake to prep. So it's not come with you to... End no, it day. hasn't. Because um, that's one that I just thought, drop that one. That one's been sort of bastardised a bit. Okay. You know, do something else. So... But bit, bits of that dish come back in various forms in other, in other ways. Right, okay. At the moment, I've got a roe deer dish on with two elements of that cauliflower dish on it. Okay, so it's, it's still there. It's in, just it's, not it's, it's, it's original in, form. Yeah, it's in some other alien form. <laughs> <laughs> so what dish if I ask that question now what is your favourite dish on the menu mine's, mine's a uh, a place dish at the minute okay we'll do a place dish with a courgette flour sauce um, pickled mussels and leeks basically everything just very fresh um, it's actually going to it's finishing next week because so courgette flour is completely done now but that's been my favourite dish for a long time okay and how have you found, um, are you working with like local suppliers and things? How yeah, so that was that? a tough thing when we first came here because no one really understood what we are trying to do. Okay. It was a, you know, people just send us really bad produce. And to set up suppliers here was very different to London. London, we don't, we don't realise how sport we are in London yeah. for produce, for, for suppliers. But produce comes out of London into London, and we get the when you're in London, you get the prime ingredients. Outside of London, you looked at, you looked at to start with as like a sort of second class um, sort of restaurant. They send you all this good stuff goes to London basically. Really? So it took a while for me to sort of not convince people, but educate them that we what we were trying to do here was completely different, yeah. and that we need to be looked at at the same standard as those restaurants in London. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Was that now, a challenge you were expecting? When you... No. No. No, I really wasn't. I was like, great. Um, <laughs> Add that to but my it's, But I, I, honestly, our butchers um, down the road legs, they from day one, they've bent over backwards for us. Okay. They have, like, really got it. Um, other people, it took a bit of time. Now they get it. Like, yeah. I had to kick off a bit, but they got it now. Yeah. And, um, yeah. But now, like, for example, we get 
you know, in cherries in season, we get cherries from one person. That's all we get from them. We get strawberries from another. We get like broccoli um, from a farm down in Eversham. And it, it takes a lot. It's a, logistically, it's a, it's a bit of a nightmare. Once you get your head around it, it's better. Yeah. It's easier. But you, you don't just get everything from one supplier or two suppliers. It's like little, unique little yeah. supplies that you just get one or two things from. And do you like that? Do you like working I do, that I do, yeah. It was really stressful at first, now it's really lovely. You've just got to be very organised. Okay. But and it's really nice because you get to know them personally and they, and they, because they do that one product, they really care about it. Yeah. And when you get it, you like, you eat it, you eat that cherry and you go, it's a bloody lovely sh- cherry. Yeah. And that person is so proud that you said that. Yeah. Right. And you can see it in their eyes and that's really nice. Have you found anything in particular that you really, really liked that you've not maybe had before or just like they do something really unique or? Well, not from suppliers. Uh, co- basically, like cob nuts we get from a supplier just literally 10 minutes down the road. Oh, okay. They're the best cob nuts I've ever tried. Yeah. And they are by far the cheapest cob nuts I've ever bought in my life. Okay, that's always a bonus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you find that local stuff is a lot cheaper. Yeah. But your answer to the question there is on the estate, We've like I've never really used damsons properly. We've got damsons coming out of our ears, and okay. like it's just nice to be able to use products that are just on your doorsteps. You can just have whatever you want. Is the plan then to be able to be like self self-sufficient? self-sufficient? I'll never say that we will never be self-sufficient. Right. Like, like we haven't got, we haven't got. Even though we've got this estate, a lot of it's arable farmland, so that land is basically rented to other people to use. So. The re- we don't. We're not growing everything for us on this 1,200 acres. We just, right. We've got a small kitchen garden, and we use stuff where, where, this, where we can from the estate. Um, we have, you know, only a team of two gardeners. They work their, what their asses off. They're fantastic. We'd never be self-sufficient. We're just not. We haven't got the capacity to do it really. Okay. We might do in the future, but we're not expanding that far yet. Yeah. And do you get game from the estate? Or? We do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we've got pheasant. Um, Basically, every game, all game apart from grouse, really. Yeah. So we've got muntjac on the menu at the minute, so that's basically a little deer, yeah. called barking deer. So we've got a gamekeeper. He goes out. Well, it depends how busy we are. We tell him, you know, we might ring him up in the middle of the week and say we need another muntjac. We use about four muntjac a week. So we tell him when he goes out the next morning or evening and shoots it. Okay. And then he brings it to us skinned, and we do the whole prep. Oh, you do the whole. Yeah, yeah. You just there's there's lots of. So I went shooting with him. There's lots of sort of rituals and things and rules you, sh- you need to stick by and they're very respectful to the animals so they stick by all of them when you go shooting yeah shooting. so when you, you know, what's when you that go, like then Is that it's really interesting um, so when you shoot an animal it, it, you know it's very a nice thing to do the right thing to do is to you know there's certain things you need to do in the field before you bring the animal back to respect that animal oh really and, they, and we really follow that like, like what so you, sh- you should take the head off Okay. It's quite gory, sorry. Um, <laughs> take the feet off um, and take the shit boy pack. And is, what, where does that, is that just like an old It's a very old tradition, thing, yeah. Or? Yeah, um, and our gamekeepers are very respectful and they really do follow it and I think it's lovely. And you can't shoot an animal after sunset. So as soon as that sun goes down, it's like, guns away, done, finished. Really? Yeah, you know, even if they don't catch anything, we have to change the menu, but they'll stick to those rules, which I really like. And I went and I, I went shooting, and I must say, as someone who eats meat, it was a very surreal f- feeling shooting an animal. Is that the first time you've done it? Yeah. How did that feel? Weird. They're, they're beautiful animals. And did you feel bad? Yeah, I did feel really bad, if I'm honest. And I and I prepped the I prepped the animal with the deer. It was a roe deer, and roe deers are absolutely stunning. Right? They aesthetically the most beautiful things to look at. Yeah. And yeah, when it was on the floor, it was really. I you know I shot that. A bit sad. Yeah, I, was like, I shot that animal. What, I've never what did, sh- I've never what did that animal do to me? That's what I thought genuinely, and I thought I can't think like that. I I used meat all day every day, and it just was a weird feeling. Because when I get when you receive meat into a kitchen, it's it's a piece of meat. Yeah. It's not an animal. Yeah. Do you know, do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, no, no, no. And then when you shoot an animal, it's it, you look at it, it's an animal on the floor, and yeah. it's a beautiful animal, and then you you feel bad. So but I had to get over that because I I had to. I had to tell myself, you know, you can't be hip- you can't be a hypocrite here. Yeah. You got to deal with this and be like, yes, this is what you do every day. Can you understand why there's such a disconnect now then between people and food? Yeah. In that respect. Yeah, I can. I can. Yeah, I can. I do. I do understand why people are eating less meat. I do. I, I, I do get it. Yeah. I'm. I'm just going to always eat meat though. I think. Yeah. 
but at I least, like it too uh, much. I mean, at least you, you have done the whole process. But, but I will admit, I couldn't eat the... So I prepped this animal and took it home. And I cooked dinner the next night. I couldn't do it that night. The next night, and it, even then, I had the dinner in front of me and I couldn't eat it. But you didn't eat it? I, I, I didn't eat it. I couldn't. I, and it's very... I probably shouldn't admit that. I, it's very surreal. It was very weird for me, but it was just because it was such a personal thing. Yeah. Because I actually, you know, had a part or had a huge part in... Yeah. It? It's not something I've ever experienced. So no, and uh, I haven't gone since. <laughs> and I, I would, I would, you think, you, you do I it would, again, yeah, because it was very, is it because it's such a very big insightful? Because like, they're quite big, rather yeah. than a bird. Or I not think, to take anything away from no, that, but well, birds, birds are quite stupid, aren't they? I mean, <laughs> I mean, we, we, when I drive to work, I really run over about twenty pheasants because they just don't <laughs> don't move out the road. Where deers, they're, they're glorious animals. Yeah. They really are. I get that. Yeah, they're, they're just beautiful. Yeah. And then you said you, you break it down. Break it, uh, yeah, we, we butcher everything yeah. here. Is that something that you um, enjoy doing and you're glad you've got the space to be oh, able it's, to do it's that? the one thing I, I absolutely... Well, it's not the one thing, so there's lots of things, but it's the one thing I really like, I love. I absolutely yeah. love. And what I do like about it is a lot of my chefs have never even seen whole animals. Right. You know, as, as, a, as a carcass. And it's nice to teach them how to prep it and... Most most of the times we, we do it after service where we can still stand there together and I show how to do it and it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a class together. Okay. So I quite like that. Yeah, yeah. And is that something that obviously is it quite a young team? And it's a very young yeah. team and most of them, you know, the guy on the meat now he's never cooked meat. We never cooked meat in his life before he came here. Now he's absolutely oh, really? rocking it. And it's nice for me to like you know he's been here you know nine months. It's nice for me to step back and go actually this guy can this guy can actually cook. Yeah like really solid yeah and I and you know it's nice knowing that I taught him that and you've always had, had big mentors in in your life yeah, so of is course, it nice yeah. to then st- take a step back and be like oh like I've, I'm almost doing this yeah back now. yeah um, really nice it's it genuinely like watching someone progress as a chef is probably one of the nicest feelings of that we get as, as being a head chef I think yeah yeah there's a lot of uh, a lot of other rubbish stuff to deal with and that's a really nice thing to balance it out yeah it's great for them that they have that opportunity to do like the butchery and so yeah, not yeah. everybody does. And w- w- what's they, nice so. is they like they, they decide, or sometimes they even ask me if they can stay behind and like show me. I'm like that's 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 your own time as well. You really yeah. do want to learn. Yeah, so that's that's another nice thing. Yeah, that is nice. So how many have you got in the team? I might as well we might as well talk about the team. In chef wise, there's me and uh, five others, six in total. Okay, and how did you find recruitment here because of obviously oh, an where absolute you are nightmare. Well, luckily, two guys, well, when we first opened, three guys from London came with me that okay. worked with me previously. Um, and then the rest we found local. We've been, we've been, we've had, we've been through quite a few chefs. Like, I thought there's, you know, everyone struggles with chefs. But there's a problem in London. When I was there, I, I thought it couldn't get any worse. It did get worse when I came here. It yeah. was a lot harder. <laughs> um, but what I have found is that people that come here now, they haven't got much experience, but they really want it. Okay. Because there's nothing, there's not much, you know, apart from going to Bristol and Birmingham, there's not too much locally on this sort of level. And they really come in, they really want to learn. So for me, it doesn't matter if they've got no experience, it matters if they want it. Yeah. And I found that the people that come in now really want it. Yeah. So that's nice because then you can teach teach people easily. If they want it, then you, all you got to do is just teach them. Yeah. So it's not that it's not that difficult now, but it was at the start. Okay. And what about front of house as well? Like, did you find that difficult? Yeah, same sort of si- same situation. Well? Same situation, really. Um, now we've got people that actually there's three people out of five of our front of house that have been here from the start. So we've had, we've had a lot. We've had a lot of turnovers of the other positions, but those three have been solid. Yeah. And now they're like crucial to this restaurant. Yeah. It's so like, important to find like loyal I, staff. I hope they don't listen to this and. So I hope they don't leave. I'll take that. Uh, they'll be asking me for pay rises after this. Because I know it's so, like, obviously we talk about staff all the time, but it's really hard to find and then retain staff. So Yeah, it really is. Well, I think it might be slightly easier outside, outside London to retain staff okay. because in London you usually sport for choice. You know if you get, if you're paid by an hour and you get £2 more an hour, five minutes down the road at another restaurant you might go there we're here like we're quite we're sort of in the middle of nowhere yeah they're quite loyal so how do you retain them what do you do to, to make it appealing for them is, it, is this something that you, you do like consciously or is it 
just treat them, treat them well. I think like educate them, make them interested, keep them on their toes, like make them want to come into work. Really, yeah. Like don't don't get me wrong. Like we have we have some days where it's it's hard work and it's tough, but we're trying to have fun as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that's the key. You can't just like make them work, you know, x amount of hours a week and just be miserable. You got to try and make them smile. Yeah. And are you all um, male? Staff in the there's a lot kitchen. of there. There's a yes, we are. We've had. I really would love love a female in the kitchen. Yeah. Not testosterone sometimes. Around. <laughs> lads. Um, lads, lads, lads. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, they're, they're a great bunch. They're, they're actually we work really well as a team. What's nice is we, everyone gels well and like, you know, we're just mates. And because we're in the country, we, we kind of do stuff together as well when our days off. Because you kind of know that you only know you, those people, and that's really it. Um, right. So. When I interviewed you last time, there's a few things that I've written down, so I just wanted to ask if they've changed at all. It's my height, one of them. That's not changed. <laughs> <laughs> I hate standing next to you. You make me feel like a giant. Oh, no, you are tall and I am short. I mean, when I see you, I want to give you a hug, and I'm like, I don't want a hug, actually. <laughs> Nothing personal. You get a chair to stand. <laughs> um, you said that your main influences were Tom Akins and Jason Atherton. Is that still the case? Still the case, Or is yeah. there any... New, no, like, no, no, still the other, case. Yeah. Honestly, for different reasons as well. Tom, I feel like Tom really taught me how to cook, and I, he let me run his kitchen, and I learned a lot about how I want to manage people. And luckily, he, he gave me free a lot of free reign on that, which was nice. And then Jason taught me um, how to sort of look at things just outside of the kitchen, look at the bigger picture, like the restaurant, you know, the details and. Well, Tom wasn't on that, but Tom was really focused in the kitchen, and that's yeah. at the point of my career. I, I didn't have any any space in my mind to even think about anything else but kitchen, yeah. you know, the food, because I was just we were grafting our yeah. stuff. But working for Jason, he just taught me like, the, I don't know, it's just I got a bit older and watching him like, you know, it it find a light bulb, like light bulbs out, like how did you see that light bulb out? Like, <laughs> he's just got an eye for detail, and that's what he taught me. Right? Yeah. Look at look at everything, look at every single bit of detail you can see. And being, having been away from them out on your own now for a long time, do you feel like you're, you're very much your own chef now, but just with those nice bits that you took from each one? Oh, totally. Uh, yeah, totally. That's exactly it. I remember when I first opened Type I'm like, when I look back on it now, I was pretty much just cooking Tom Aiken's food. But, yeah. All right, that's, and that's, but that's what, was that consciously? No, of course not. No, I, I, I thought I was doing my own, but then some, <laughs> re, what you don't, don't realise is that I was there for four years, that's what I did, that's what, you know, my main, a lot yeah. of my main training and you just do that subconsciously. I think a lot of chefs do and I think a lot of chefs get quite a bit of grief for it. They should be allowed to have a bit of breathing, breathing time to get their own, find their own feet because now I feel like it is my own style. Yeah. But it takes time. Is it quite, is it quite tough to kind of step away from that? From what you know? Yeah. yeah of course it is and I think that's in any job. Yeah. Like, not just cooking but it just takes time to, to get your own style going to be confident with your own style because you know you're confident with someone else's because you've done it for years yeah um and when it comes to your own you're a bit more sort of ah oh, is that good enough kind of thing yeah but then you get comfortable and it's fine when did you realize you were confident in your own style oh god that's a good question yesterday no, i'm joking <laughs> I, don't, I don't i don't know i don't uh, i can pinpoint when no there was a couple of years ago some point some point yeah do accolades help that confidence I think without you don't yeah I guess they do but it shouldn't should it but I guess they probably do yeah <laughs> of course it does it's no it's really nice to be recognized by by you know like an, any of the any award systems really good food guide AA mission whatever it, whatever it may be hardens of course it's nice because recognition for you and the team yeah right because otherwise you're just slogging it out working your asses off and then at the end of the end of it you don't really get much back from it to say well done guys this is what we've achieved yeah. so you know when we won when we won Michelin when you get AA rosettes whatever it is or in the good food guide you can go to people and say look look at what we've achieved because it's written there in writing yeah. or you've got a plaque on the wall whatever it may be and it's like well actually then they might understand oh yeah that's why we work so hard and yeah. we're so you know into what we do is there anything that you've got left that like accolade wise that you want to kind of tick off or was was Michelin always kind of the one and now yeah, you've well, got that is honestly I didn't I didn't 
we, we didn't open this restaurant going, right, we're going to get a star, I want a star. Not that I give up on Michelin, but I just was like, it's not, I don't think chefs should open restaurants to strive for Michelin, because it's not healthy in any way. Yeah. Um, so we didn't strive for that, and I'm not, we're not striving for any more accolades, it's not something that I want to do. I, don't, I really don't think it's a healthy thing to do. Okay. So no, what we've, what we've achieved I think is fantastic, and yeah. I'm happy with what, what we've got at the moment. Yeah, yeah, cool. And you said restaurants or chefs that you admired um, were uh, places like Clove Club, Lyles, Dairy, uh, Man Behind the Curtain. Is is that the same, or have you changed? Do you think what you like? Has no, changed? I, I still, I still, I still love those restaurants. Yeah. Um, there's other restaurants now that I'd mentioned that I, that I absolutely love, Brat. Um, of course, the one and only Cornerstone. <laughs> Tom Brown is here with me today. Um, where, who else? Oh, Gre- I recently went to the greenhouse. That was absolutely stunning. Yeah, I saw that on your... Honestly. Uh, was it your Instagram? I reckon thing? three stars soon. Yeah. Just putting it out there, everyone. Three stars, greenhouse. <laughs> I'm sure you will think it. Don't start doing predictions now. Well, hey, might as well start show. now. <laughs> might as well. We get it in. Get it in early. Back in the box. <laughs> <laughs> Get it back out again. <laughs> yeah, true. I reckon we should put that away for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, amazing meal at Greenhouse. Honestly, it was phenomenal from start to finish. It was details are just next level. Yeah. And it's just tasty. And yeah, I, I ate there. Oh, I don't know how long years ago. Tom Aiken sent me there as a present. Um, and it, it's really up to its game. Obviously, a different chef, but. It's just phenomenal. Yeah. Best meal I've had in a long, long time. Okay. Any anyone else that you kind of look at and think? So I said brat. Brat I love because just it's just ingredient-led, simple, tasty cooking. Yeah. And I think I go there. I've been there probably nine times or something okay. stupid. Right, I love it. Yeah. Um, where else? I haven't eaten. I haven't eaten out that much. I'm honest. No. No, I've been grafting away here. Some of the kind of the restaurants you mentioned in that that kind of generation of of chefs you all seem like mates when I talk to chefs now yeah. it's, it's almost like you've got like this like you're all friends and it's funny because when I was growing up when I was growing up as a kid that sounds like an old man <laughs> back in my day um, no, when I was when I was a younger chef I, I, I just genuinely got the impression that other, other chefs hated each other if you worked at like other head chefs like you know but and I think they did but now it's changed we all support each other yeah we're all, like, we're all very much alike each other. Even if we don't get on, chefs, you've got a lot in common. Yeah. To like, there's a lot of mutual respect there, because you do the same hours, you, you you're striving for a lot of the same things. You know, you can relate in many ways to whatever yeah. your lifestyles. So even if even if you're not close friends, you respect each other and you you get on because you have so much in common. Yeah. And then yeah, I think like most of my friends now are chefs. Yeah. I've got obviously other friends, but <laughs> I ain't really. <laughs> liar. Yeah, I'm a liar, I'm a loner. <laughs> um, no, I've, yeah, most of my friends are chefs because you, you've already got that automatic talking point. You've got that, yeah. those conversations just flow because you've got so much in common. Yeah. Do you think? And you work the same hours. Oh well, yeah. I mean, you've you've got Mondays off. <laughs> who the, who the fuck else have Mondays off? <laughs> Do you think that, um, like, kind of those friendships and things has helped improve the food scene in the UK because it's broken down those barriers and because you all go to each other's restaurants? Doing collaborations, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like, right, 100%. And collaboration has become a big thing. It's not a new thing anymore, you know. Yeah. Everyone's doing it. And I, I think it should continue happening forever because yeah. it's just a good way of chefs helping each other out and becoming a bigger network yeah. and a supporting network. Like if someone opens a restaurant and they do crowdfunding, and some of the prizes they they give to guests for crowdfunding, or the gifts they give to guests for crowdfunding are a ticket to a collaboration event. Yeah. And that chef, like Tom Brown, you know, wherever it may be, they they do that off the goodness of their heart. It's not they're not getting paid for it. No. And they're doing that to support someone else. And that's a fantastic thing to do. Yeah. So that's what that's, I think that should just continue forever. Do you think social media has helped bring everyone together as well? Yeah, it has. Yeah, because now it's very easy to connect with people. Yeah. So if I want to, if I don't know a chef and I've never spoke to him or met him before social media, you'd have to go maybe go to his restaurant and talk to him. But now you can just find him on Instagram, send him, slide into his to, slide into his DMs. <laughs> God forbid you have to go face to face for a yeah. person and talk to them. Yeah. 
slide into his DMs and harass him <laughs> till he answers. <laughs> What's the best DM slide you've ever had? <laughs> what that I've done, what that I've done, or someone else's? Both. <laughs> oh my god. Um, <laughs> I can't think right now. Uh, no, I, I don't know. Have you had anyone follow you where you've been like, that's quite cool? Um, yeah, like when Rene Rezepi follows you, or like Gordon Ramsay follows you, that's nice. Yeah. Like, yeah, they're really cool things. Mostly chefs or, or musicians, like Miles Kane, or like just people you know, you end up meeting through this industry, like like before you knew, before you met them, they were like, you idolise them in some sort of way. They're, yeah. they're, they're rock stars, or they're, they're rock stars within the chef way or, or actually a rock star way yeah. and you think and then you actually meet them it's actually a bit surreal but it's lovely yeah yeah so that's yeah no DMs though that I can think of no? no <laughs> <laughs> I've never asked a chef that question before you should ask that. every chef that oh, right. question what's the best? yeah, yeah you've got to answer it though you've, you've got what's the weirdest the DM oh yeah what is your weirdest That'd be a good question to ask a lot. I think you'd get some good answers there. What's yours been? The weirdest? Um, Do the weirdest come when you like on telly and stuff like that? Yeah, I think that's yeah, when my weirdest were. When yeah. I put on the Cambridge menu. There's some weird people out there. <laughs> Very odd. I'm not saying what it was. Why? Because I'm just not. <laughs> but it was, it was odd. Say what it is and then I'll cut it out. No. <laughs> joking. <laughs> it comes stupid. <laughs> so... You said obviously it opens up your connections within the industry, but it also it, it allows people to connect with you that aren't in the industry. So it's always fun, though, isn't it? It's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need to elaborate so we understand nah. why it's interesting. I'll let you all find out for yourselves. <laughs> so, um, what is the like? What is the end goal for pencils? Like, what have you got? Because it's still so young, but have you got like a, a plan? Have you got this is where I want to take it to? To be honest, it's only we're only what nine, ten months in. I yeah. think I can't actually think straight now. I haven't thought that far ahead. Okay. It's more. I'm still. I, I still. I'm still opening a restaurant in my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're not. We're not. I feel like I've, there's lots more we can achieve here, and lots more I want, where I want. Lots more to do to get to where I want to be. Yeah. And that's pretty still what I'm focused on. Like, it's still working in the restaurant in my eyes. Yeah. Um, I haven't thought, like, what's next or... Because you've how achieved we, how, so much, it probably feels very... I want to expand the garden in, in the future. Um, I would love to get, you know... We've got a very small kitchen. I want to get maybe, you know, expand on the kitchen size, but that all comes, you know, when the, when the profits start yeah. rolling in. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, we were just a very young restaurant still. I haven't thought that far ahead. What about you? What's your plan? Like, what do you, where do you sit? Like, when do you get to retire? <laughs> Next month, don't I? <laughs> I'm sure I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Um, like, do you, like, do you see I'm, yourself beyond? I don't know if I could retire. I think I'd drive myself nuts. I'm like I'm like a jack in the box. I can't sit still. If you didn't drive yourself nuts. I'm sure you'd drive I'd, somebody. I'd drive my girlfriend nuts for sure. <laughs> I think I would drive her nuts. Um, yeah, no, I don't don't think I could retire. I'd have to do something constantly. Yeah. I couldn't sit at home, I should tell you. No, but you could go. I don't know. Would you want to like go Eat travel? Or like, yeah, I've done I've done a fair bit of travelling, and I, I always want to travel. Yeah. That's something I do want to do. But at the moment, I can't even think about that because I've just opened a restaurant. So. Yeah. Head down. Focus. Focus. Yeah. And then this time, well, next year, obviously now you're in retaining star mode instead of getting one. waiting for star. Well, that's harder. No, it's more pressure. Yeah, how do you feel about that? Well, it's, it's, well, it's, you know, it's, it's just now you get, before, when you, when you haven't got star, it's, oh, it's a lovely restaurant and yeah, it's fantastic and there's no expectations as such. Yeah. And then when you get one, it's... We haven't had anyone say anything. Maybe it's just in my mind that people are expecting more. Well, I was speaking to uh, Lisa Allen at Northcote and she said you like enjoy it for like, I don't know, that like, you get it and then you're instantly like, right, okay, now I've got to retain it again. So well, my girlfriend said to me the other day, she was like, are you, are you actually going to enjoy, enjoy the fact that you've got Mission Star? I was like, what do you mean? I was like, oh, well, you just seem like right now, you know, fo so focused. You haven't really stepped back and taken the time to say, right, I've actually got to start kind of thing. Yeah. 
which is maybe a little bit true, but it happened, as I said, when the plaque went up. Yeah. Until then, it was just head down. It's like, right, it doesn't change anything. Yeah. You've still got to go to work and get on with it and produce the same st standard of food as you did, you know. Isn't it interesting that this small little guidebook... From Makes this, so yeah. much impact on people. Yeah. Just a few little words, yeah. little paragraph. It's mental. Do you think Michelin understand the, the pressure that they I put on I hope they chefs? do, yeah, I think they do. I think they do. I think a lot of chefs, including myself, probably put too much pressure on ourselves with Michelin. Is it them or is it us, kind of thing? Yeah. That's probably us. Yeah. Come on, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves, chefs, don't we? Well, yeah. You are, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and rightly so, because we care about what we do, and we're so into it, and yeah. we put so much effort and time into it, and sacrifice quite a bit to do that. You would care, naturally. Yeah. I mean, you'd be silly not to. Do you think um, people's expectations have changed of Pencils now you've got a start? No, they haven't, actually. People, in all, in all, in all honesty, like, our customer feedback is fantastic, and I couldn't ask for better. Like, the locals, they come back and back, and everyone has just been complimentary. So... No, no, I haven't noticed it yet. No. I might, I might at some point, I don't know. But. And I suppose, like, my final question would be, do you feel like now that you have a star that you can't change anything? Like, would you feel worried no, not to at change all. anything? No, now I want to change load, like, all of it. Oh, right, OK. Because I'm going the opposite way. Okay. I'm not going to, I'm going to be smart. <laughs> Keep the staple. Um, no, but now I'm, you know, obviously, I think getting it builds you with a little bit of confidence, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, I'm quite a confident person, but getting it kind of cements you on the right path. So it's nice to feel like, okay, I'm doing something right. Yeah. And that's just a nice feeling, isn't it? Yeah. So then I'm kind of a bit more like, right, okay, I'm going to do this, this and this. Because you're not more, not thinking, oh, is, that, is it going to be good? Yeah. Of course you think it's going to be good, but you're not so worried about it. That's it? That's it. Yeah. It's right. a long, long interview. <laughs> it wasn't that long, was it? Right. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this interview. And if you have any comments, feel free to tweet us or comment on the post. Uh, we're making all of our interviews available to download. And finally, if you like what we do, whether it's our podcast or our videos or even our features, please head over to our Patreon page and support us there.